Welcome to today's Bible study offered by College Lutheran Church in Salem, Virginia, and by me, Pastor David Drebus. It's good for us to study God's Word. We continue to do that by working our way through the top 100 essential Bible passages, a list put together by the Reverend Dr. Dave Delaney. Thank you, Dave, for this list. You can find it linked in the description of this video. We've come today to lesson number 13, the call of Moses found in Exodus chapter 3. So I hope you read Exodus 3 before watching this video, and I hope you'll read uh, chapters 1 through 2 and maybe chapter 4 as well. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff in the book of Exodus, and I do want to catch you up on what's happening in the story of God's people so far. In uh, the end of Genesis, if you remember our previous Bible studies, uh, we followed the story of Joseph, who had been sold into slavery in Egypt, and eventually he ends up saving Egypt and all the people of the region uh, in a famine, thanks to God being at work through him, and he's uh, reconciled with his brothers. And the book of Genesis ends with Joseph and his family living happily ever after in Egypt. They have a pretty good deal with the Pharaoh there. But then the book of Exodus begins, and we're told in verse um, in chapter 1, there arose in Egypt a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And this Pharaoh begins to fear the people of Israel. Um, they are a strong people. Uh, they are still regarded as foreigners. And so this Pharaoh wants to... Um, really uh, break them as a people. Uh, he uh, makes them slaves. He wants um, the uh, midwives of the Hebrew people to kill any males who are born, but the midwives uh, disobey and use some trickery to, um, to save the newborn uh, Hebrew males. Um, a real good example of civil disobedience in our Bible. And uh, fearing God and not fearing the Pharaoh is the way it's put in Exodus chapter 1. Um, so that's happening. Uh, Moses is saved um, by, um, by the midwife who uh, delivers him and uh, ends up growing up among uh, the Egyptians. So that's the salvation of Moses. You also have the shame of Moses. In anger, he kills uh, an Egyptian who had struck a Hebrew, and uh, Moses has to flee because now the Pharaoh wants him dead, and um, he runs away to the land of Midian and ends up uh, tending sheep there for his father-in-law. Um, so that's, that's the story so far, and I do hope you'll read it because there's interesting details in these early chapters of Exodus. Now, Chapter 3 of Exodus is what we're going to focus on, and uh, it's been a while since we've uh, done one of these Bible studies, at least from my perspective. Uh, for all I know, you're watching them one right after the other. That's how YouTube works. Um, but uh, I just need to remind myself of the three questions uh, that help me uh, receive what the Bible is doing as I read it. Uh, rather than coming to the Bible with an agenda, I think it's more helpful to let the scriptures uh, do work on me and you as we read the scriptures. So those questions are, uh, what is puzzling me as I read the text? Um, how is the text challenging me? And how is the text uh, comforting me? I find those to be three questions that really help um, me as I, as I read the Bible. What's puzzling here in chapter 3 is uh, when God gives his name to Moses in verse 14, God gives the name, I am that I am. At least that's how it reads in this translation. Uh, other Bibles uh, may say, uh, I will be who I will be, or I was what I was. I am who I am. Um, these are all different ways of translating uh, this holy name for God uh, that's sometimes mistranslated Jehovah, uh, by the way, and um, has uh, another way of being said, um, that you may have heard, uh, the name Yahweh um, is another way of saying this name, but it's really the Hebrew word for being. Um, and what's intriguing about that is so many other cultures at the, at the time of the scriptures, you know, they worshiped gods who had control of rivers or gods who, you know, lived on mountains or gods who uh, blessed harvests if you uh, were nice enough to this god. Um, 
the God of our Bible, the God we worship, the God we believe in, uh, the God who reveals himself to Moses, is so far beyond these more conventional ideas of deities. Um, this is the God who is the ground of all being, who created the world, who creates the world um, continuously, is always um, recreating the world. We could get into that sometime. Um, there's something so much grander, something more mysterious, um, something truly puzzling about our God, um, that he's not uh, confined to one place or uh, one activity, but is in fact the, the ground of all being. And that is uh, what is meant by this name. Uh, I am that I am. Uh, tell them that I am has sent you. Um, what, a, what an intriguing name. What a puzzling name. Now, this text also uh, challenges me. Um, frankly, every time God picks a person and says, you need to go and um, save these people or do this good work, there's a part of me that is always challenged by that because part of me wonders, why doesn't God just do it himself? If the people of uh, Israel need to be delivered from Egypt, why doesn't God just do that? Uh, why does God need to... Uh, call Moses to do this? And I must tell you, I don't have a great answer to that question other than it's how our mysterious God likes to operate. Um, so that's challenging. Um, it reminds me that God is not a puppeteer, uh, that this creation is not some play that God is uh, controlling, uh, but instead, you know, there's something more creative about God making a world um, that he doesn't control every element of, uh, but instead calls people uh, to do good works for others. That's the closest I get to an answer, but it is still challenging. And every time there's a call story in the Bible, um, as wonderful as a story it might be, and this is a pretty neat one among the call stories in the scriptures, there's always in the back of my head that question, uh, why doesn't God just do it himself? So, um, not really an answer, but certainly a challenge uh, to me as I read it. Well, this uh, mysterious way that God works through people, um, much as it challenges me, maybe even annoys me, if you can catch the tone of my voice here, um, there is also something comforting about it when, uh, once again, we look at who God calls. And uh, God works through real people, and our scriptures are unique. Um, the, the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures of the New Testament um, have a unique perspective among holy texts in that uh, we don't wipe away the, um, the problems uh, that these heroic figures have. The, these are um, very real people. Um, so Moses has anger issues uh, throughout uh, his story in our Bible. We see that at the beginning with him uh, striking the Egyptian in anger and murdering him and then covering him up in the sand because uh, he's ashamed of what he's done. This is a very flawed person. And Moses agrees that he's flawed. Uh, part of why I hope you'll keep reading uh, beyond chapter 3 is it takes a whole other chapter, chapter 4, of Moses giving uh, one reason after another as to why he is a bad choice uh, to do this work. Uh, he keeps arguing with God, you know, not me, not me. Um, but, um, you know, Moses doesn't measure up to his own standards, his own idea of who would be called by God. And Moses doesn't measure up to the standards of, um, of others um, because of what he's done and who he is. So that's um, just, that's been a repeated theme in these, in these early chapters of the Bible, that God calls people that we wouldn't expect, that God calls real people who are not perfect. And uh, there's something comforting about that. Um, and I would just leave us with this thought that... Um, you know, the world may say Moses is not the right choice. Moses himself says he's not the right choice, um, but he is the right choice. And that will be clear for the um, uh, what happens um, next in his story. And he's the right choice because he's the one whom God has called. And when you are called by God to do something, God doesn't just push you into the deep end and say, uh, you're on your own. Those who are called by God are equipped by God. And uh, that's true for me, and that is true for you. 
you have a calling to serve your neighbor and you may come up with all sorts of reasons why you are not a good choice uh, to do good things for your neighbor um, but God has called you to do that um, God has freed you through the gospel uh, to know that you don't have to get everything perfect as you go about doing good works for others and if God has put someone in your life uh, that you are able to help I hope you hear that and see that as a calling and I hope you can have some confidence um, knowing uh, that God is with you and um, that if you need help I hope you'll reach out to your fellow Christians uh, for support but um, if you need help figuring out what you're called to do uh, that's what the church is for that's what your fellow Christians are for and that is the work that God does always calling us uh, to do good things for others and not just say, calling us and then saying we're on our own um, but you are the right person if you're the one God has called to do this thing or that thing. And um, I just hope you know that, and um, I hope uh, that your eyes are opened uh, to that truth in your life. Amen.